So it was stunning that a drug could start as late as that and still have a full lifespan benefit. That really was news scientifically, and I think that's one of the reasons why the editors of Nature were interested in it. There really are some notable successes. I want to talk about those. What was the first exogenous molecule that proved a lifespan extension success for the ITP? Yeah, well, rapamycin uh, in, in our 2009 paper had a really big effect. Uh, at, we picked a dose that seemed like it it might work, and it did. It's not the optimal dose, it's less than the optimal dose, but at the dose we chose, both males and females had a significant lifespan extension. To put this into perspective, these drugs are giving, at the mi middle dose, 15 to 20% increase in median lifespan. To, to give a sense of what that means, if you had a cure for cancer in people, no one over the age of 50 ever got cancer again. Median lifespan of humans would go up by 3%. And the same is true if you had a drug that abolished heart attacks. No one over the age of 50 ever got a heart attack again. Median lifespan for people would go up by less than 3%. That's work done by Jay Olshansky and Bruce Carnes and published in Science in 1990. So the drugs that we consider, you know, we have four of these now that give more than a 10% increase in lifespan in terms of proportional change of healthy lifespan are doing about three times better than some hypothetical drug that abolished cancer in people or abolished heart attacks in people. So there, that's a really significant chunk of additional uh, healthy lifespan. Rapamycin in that first paper was also the first drug, I believe, where anyone had showed, we, we found, that it works quite well, even if you start in really old mice. Some of the mice that were exposed in that paper did start until 20 months of age, where the median survival is about 24 for males and 26 for females. It took me very much by surprise. We thought only drugs, if a drug was going to slow aging, you really do have to start it when you're young, because a lot of aging is what happens between the ages of 20 and 60 or something like that, as everyone knows. So it was stunning that a drug could start as late as that and still have a full lifespan benefit. That's really was news scientifically, and I think that's one of the reasons why the editors of Nature were interested in it. But that turns out not to be a fluke. 17 alpha estradiol, which is male specific, works just great if you start it at 16 or 20 months of age in the males. A carbose, which is significant in males and females, though better for males, if you start it in middle age, it still works. It's only about half as good. Starting early is smart for a carbose, but even if you start it, at uh, 16 to 20 months of age, it still works just fine. Canagliflozin, our data in, in that group um, haven't been published yet. For males, it's still terrific. For females, as I mentioned, it actually isn't good, but we suspect it's because the, the drug dose, the drug concentrations in the blood of females may be toxic. So we really want to do that again, but with lower concentrations of the drug. Do you have a sense of why rapamycin and canagliflozin are being more concentrated in females? And are you seeing that with any of the other successful candid drugs, such as uh, can I, uh, such as acarbos, for example, or 17 uh, beta estradiol, 17 alpha estradiol, sorry. We don't know the answers for any one of those drugs. It wouldn't be too hard to find out. You know, a pharmacologist could look at how quickly it's absorbed, how quickly is it conjugated, how quickly is it excreted, does it go out in the urine, does it go out in the feces, all of that. There's very standard 50-year-old methods for answering that question, and, you know, it's, I think would be important to address. There's a generic answer, which is really quite firmly established. The enzymes that the liver uses to deal with foreign drugs, these are called enzymes of xenometab xenobiotic metabolism, xenobiotic metabolizing enzymes, are radically different mm. between men and women and between male and female mice. Most of them, not all, but most of them are a lot higher in females, but some are a lot higher in males, and this is also true for people. So the pace at which drugs are conjugated, put into the bile or put into the urine or excreted in the feces or excreted in the urine, very often are sex specific. Um, it, it's, would not, it's not, it doesn't surprise anyone to find that the blood concentrations may be different in men and women or different between uh, male and female mice. The details on a drug by drug basis, we haven't looked at yet. The, the one thing I, w I would want to um, add here as a footnote is for acarbose, it has nothing to do with that. Acarbose nearly all of it stays in the gut. It doesn't get absorbed right. into the body, so excretion is not the key issue. Um, why the acarbose has such a big effect in males and a small, significant, but small effect in females is unknown. It presumably has to do with 
males being more sensitive to high glucose levels. A carbose probably works by limiting very high glucose levels, maybe for unknown reasons that triggers something horrible in the males and not so much in females. When you talk about the difference in the pharmacokinetics between male and female mice, we can only extrapolate and say that our, you know, cytochrome P450 system as humans must have sex differences. Oh yeah, that's well documented, absolutely. But what I can't tell you for the life of me, Rich, is one drug that I'm aware of that we really differentially dose in males and females beyond a weight difference. In other words, we don't seem to take into account that difference when we give a person an antibiotic or a statin or a chemotherapy. They're all based on either weight or nothing at all. I guess what I'm saying is this is kind of remarkable to me that we don't have a better set of the pharmacokinetics of these drugs and their differences in human sex and how that maybe should factor into how we think about dosing them. I would love to see you have on your show a real pharmacologist who knows the answers to that question. I would love to talk to a real pharmacologist and ask him or her, hey, aren't there differences between men and women in the rate at which drugs yeah. are excreted? And why isn't that informing our recommendations for drug doses in people? I think it's a really good question, but I don't know the answer. Thank you.